suffer from a lack of motivation, a lack of ideas, distractions, and a loss of words. This is exactly what our next panelists are going to discuss in a workshop titled When the Muse Bites, consisting of authors Bhai Chand Patel, Raghav Chandra, and Dr. Harshali Singh, and chaired by publisher and director of Readomania, Dipankar Mukherjee. This session will en enlighten all writers and budi budding authors and help them kickstart their journey. Thank you so much. Uh, may I request all of you to come closer? I mean, it's anyways, we have a few empty chairs here, so if you don't mind, just come closer. No hard and fast rule, but if you feel like coming, all the reserved chairs are open. You can happily come and sit here as well. They're more comfortable. So a very good afternoon to all of you. And thank you so much for being with us in this particular session where we're going to discuss about writing and what the erudite panel has written about under the topic, When the Muse Bites. We have with us three illustrious people who've had wonderful careers and yet they took on writing additionally and the first question i want to put forward to all the panelists starting from harshali and then raghav ji and mr patel that what brought you to writing harshali so hello um so i was always writing and um in different formats uh, i'm a trained physiotherapist and then I was an educationist for 15 years. So there was always writing happening. And then I joined Consumer Forum as a judge. So there was different kind of writing. Um, so I was always writing, as I said, in journals, etc. But I took writing very, very seriously when I realized that, uh, that as a woman, I wanted to tell a particular story that had been percolating inside me. And uh, from there, actually, from there, and we, ha we have obviously uh, staunch supporters with family and friends who, uh, you know, said that why don't you do it seriously and then people kind of took up the book uh, happily. So yeah, so you're saying your point is that you want to talk about the women's stories around you and hence you wrote stories about them. Yes. Great, that's a great start. Raghav ji, what was your reason to start writing? You know, I wanted to write uh, in school all the time and I was a blogger in 2000 and. Uh, uh, five, six, and uh, my first book, Scent of a Game, is about tiger poaching and uh, conservation. So, and that was the year 2006, if you recall, was when tigers were getting killed all over the country in a big way, electrocuted, uh, or uh, run over by vehicles, or shot. And it became a sensational big story, and the Prime Minister, in fact, at that time, Manmohan Singh ordered a CBI inquiry into the vanishing of tigers from Sariska. So I thought, here's a very interesting story, and I'm in the thick of it as a uh, principal secretary posted in Madhya Pradesh, looking uh, after various aspects of this, uh, administration. I had lots of material to talk about. The second time I wrote this book called Kali's Daughter uh, was uh, when I got moved from the post of Chairman National Highway Authority, where I had a very intense job, to a job which otherwise seemed less uh, uh, strenuous as the secretary of the National uh, Commission for Scheduled Tribes, a constitutional body. And I was dealing with so much material on atrocities against uh, tribes and against Harijans. And I thought that, well, here's a wonderful opportunity to capitalize on the material to the perceptions, to the experience that I have. And I wanted to write about the IAS Academy and life in the civil services and the IAS and IFS. And I said, let me convert all that into a human interest story on the civil services and about caste, and that's what it is about. It's absolutely wonderful. In fact, bureaucrats do have a lot of content that goes in them. And if we have more books from bureaucrats, it's always good to see the other side of life. So we'll come on, uh, come and talk more about the book. Mr. Patel, how did you start writing? Oh, like, like the other two. You can, can close it, hold yeah. yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, I also wanted to be a writer. But uh, I didn't want to work in a newspaper or something like that. If I was going to write a book, I could have made money. You can't survive writing a book uh, unless you are Chetan Bhagat or William Garam Bill or the one out of a thousand can survive in writing a book. So I had to make, make earn a living. So until I, until I was about 60, uh, well, un until exactly when I became 60, until then I was employed. 
So making money and uh, getting a pension. So now I'm getting a pension, a decent pension, so I can write. You know, I, I'm not. You know, you buy this book. Uh, I'll get hundred rupees out of it. You know, and uh, if you sell, if I, if it sells three thousand, it becomes a bestseller. So how much do I make? You know, it's really you can't live on writing. It takes about, it takes took me about two years to write this book. So uh, you know, it, it, uh, so I started writing after I retired. I had a choice: either I play golf or I write. And I didn't want to play golf. I didn't want to do anything else but write. I, I get a lot of pleasure out of writing it. I do it for pleasure, not for money. So that's very interesting. You write golf or you write? You play golf or you write? And you chose to write. That's interesting. So we'll come and hold that thought later again. Harshali, back to you on the question that you've written two books and both are on family, fam, you know, family and uh, around family issues and stuff. One very nice and about emotions. The other very provocative and loud. How did you decide about this whole point that you wanted to write? You had so many experiences about women. So why did you pick up this aspect to write in both the cases? Uh, so uh, this is one of the questions that I get asked a lot. Uh, but actually, both, both the books contain content which I have not experienced. I have experienced uh, different struggles, but the first book, as you said, it's not nice. It's about domestic violence. It's about marital rape. It's about a woman's struggle and challenges she faces to find love after a bad relationship or after a bad marriage. So, um, so these are not things I have experienced, but things I see happening around me and things that make me question that why are we still in this uh, mode as a society that we are allowing this to happen as parents, as siblings, as even women, that we allow ourselves to be in that situation. We are all educated. So the book was about uh, uh, an, an educated woman who, get, woman who gets married and is in a bad marriage and then te finds love. So it ends on a hopeful note. So again, I'll just clarify the, it's a series called the Haveli series, out of which there are seven children and the first daughter, this is the story of the first daughter. And then I wrote the second book, which was the story of the second daughter called Anatomy of Choice. Again, in this book, the content is about, is slightly risque. It's about uh, a girl who's in a live-in relationship. She's had a threesome. And uh, then what are the consequences she faces? What is the backlash she faces? Because she does not tell her parents that why she's come back home, etc. So again, these are not uh, things that I have experienced as an author. But let me... We understand you're reiterating <laughs> the fact that since you've written about threesome and you're, you know, because you're not experiencing it, because that question said, comes back to you. So I said that uh, people would uh, assume that because I've written about it, I have experienced, experienced it. I'm sure a lot of people in the audience are already wondering, okay, <laughs> how does she know about that in that case? So coming back to that later on, Raghav ji, you've picked up caste in your second book. Okay, caste I think is the most uh, uh, politically charged element of religion in the country. Did you not uh, uh, think that uh, I'm picking up a very controversial topic, it may Im impact me? What was the thought process going on picking caste as an underlying factor for your book? So, you know, uh, as a civil servant, uh, one does experience lots of uh, 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 things in one's life. And uh, being a non-Dalit, I actually felt that here was a great opportunity for me to write on a subject about which, so far, there has only been what is known, you know, colloquially as Dalit literature, you know, literature written by Dalits about their experiences of exploitation. Most of these experiences are rather grisly, gr grimy, where uh, their huts have been burnt, or their women have been raped, or they've been dispossessed of their land. And uh, the Atrocities Act, if you see, and there was a lot of debate about the Atrocities Act when the Supreme Court said that you don't have to be arrested prima facie uh, until and unless there is an investigation. So there uh, is this perception that, uh, you know, uh, Dalits only experience physical torture and physical uh, atrocities. Whereas uh, I thought that there is a lot of, there are lots of subtleties involved with this whole subject. And in a modern world which is fast evolving, uh, now the, uh, what a Dalit is experiencing is mental torture and the psychological thing. And so this uh, protagonist in my story is a young girl who is in the foreign service and she's posted in Geneva 
as uh, and uh, the UN uh, uh, Human Rights Council has brought out a very nasty report about caste-based discrimination in India. She is uh, tasked to refute it. That's her job. She's looking after UNHRC matters. And while she's preparing her refutation, she experiences and she reflects on her past uh, broken relationships, which have broken because of the existence of caste and the subtleties of, you know, of people, what they say, how they react to a Dalit. Uh, those are the kind of things that have been brought out. She's not actually physically humiliated, but it's a mental torture as a lot of us go through it in different ways. And I agree with you that, you know, the, the, the not so privileged classes definitely have a bigger burden on them. So I thought this was a story which was crying to be told. And while I was in that, you know, in that eco space, mm -hmm. I could write it later. Perhaps I would either lose the urge to write it or I would not be able to pull up my uh, resources, muster them to write it so effectively. Yeah, Obviously, you're not here at the earlier session where a Dalit spoke. Yes, Mr. Mr. Manohar Bhaipari. What he said, non-Dalits have no business writing about us. You know, uh, I wish you were here. You could have argued that. Uh, I, I don't agree with him, but he, he yeah, says... May, may I answer that? No, we, uh, okay. well, that's, that's, that doesn't go on. Yes. So, uh, Mr. Patel, I have a question for you on this. You wrote an autobiography. You, told, you wanted to share your life with others and how exciting and how, uh, you know, uh, you had your ups and downs as well. One thing that caught my attention is that you've apparently lived with a motto that uh, live, uh, you know, work hard and party harder. Okay. Now, have you reflected that as well in your book? And why would you say that? And what do you think our current generation is ready for taking something like that? What, uh, work hard? Uh, party harder. I, I don't know I, I, about that. Uh, I do party hard and I do, I, well, I don't now. But when I was uh, employed, I worked hard also. Um, the, you, you can't, def you can't uh, uh, select. You can do both quite easily. If you're, if you, are, uh, you know, I feel very young. I, I'm 83. I'm the oldest here in the room probably. Uh, but uh, my friends are 60, uh, 35, 40. You know, I have no problem with that. You know, and uh, I, I actually I enjoy the company of the younger people, and surprisingly they enjoy my company. Uh, so we party, and I, at my parties, I don't think there are many people over 60, you know, and uh, that's fine with me. I love it, you know. I, I, get, I, I get energized by mixing with the younger crowd. So I'm sure there's something very interesting about your life that you wanted to share with the generations, and that's the reason you wrote your autobiography. So what do you think is the most important, uh, you know, uh, lesson that you want to leave uh, for the audience, for the generations through your book? Uh, take it easy. That's really yeah, don't take yourself too seriously, you know. We Indians do, and I'm not an Indian, so I, I can say that. I'm from Fiji Islands. Uh, you guys take yourselves very seriously. Uh, you know, when I go to the gym, the, the men, you know, in, in, their, in their short pants or even naked, all they talk about is the business, you know, how, how important they are, how much money they're making. I don't give a damn how much you're making or how much you don't, you know. Enjoy life, take it easy, relax. That's my ph philosophy. Uh, I want to just throw a question back at the audience before I can come back to the panel again, that we all talk about books. In fact, we are here for the Literature Festival. What do you look for in a book that you pick up to read? Do you look for a, uh, a message, an uh, incident, or something that you don't know of? What exactly draws you to a book? Do we have a, a volunteer with a mic here? Volunteers, do you have a mic that you can take around for the audience? I have a lady here with a question. Yeah, Just give me a minute, he's getting the mic. Volunteers? Yeah, just getting the mic. Yes, over here. So uh, it has to have a good narrative, mm -hmm. eh? and it should be about a subject which I don't know enough about. So that kind of draws me to a book because you know it exposes me to a probably a life or area or subject. Interesting. Yes, absolutely. That that makes a lot of sense. Anybody but else? the narrative, the fiction is. <laughs> Great, absolutely. We have one hand there, then one hand here. Yeah, the gentleman there. Yes. Sir, we want to know uh, about the idea carried by th that author. Okay. Then Great, the idea that the author is trying to program. Yes, uh, one over here. Yeah. The lady in front. Yeah. Sir, I am MHS Sharma, oldest living ITN of India more than 80 year old. My question, ground reality to all of you, there 
90% books in our library have never been issued once. I was sitting, please listen to me, I was sitting in a CSIR library, this is the ground reality, you don't know, I'm sharing with you. The librarian employed three laborer and they're tearing off the books. I say, what you are doing? She showed me an English time that Indians should not be allowed, it is better to throw them. Even today, in 2019. I'm sure I there are perspectives that are there all I around. Listen, I complained PM office, my library card was cancelled. I'm sharing with yes, you. Yes, point the taken. Here. Thank you, sir. May, may I have the mic given to Lee? Yeah. Yes. So when I pick a book, um, I look for honesty. One, uh, I don't like books that pander to uh, awards or to uh, being a bestseller. And the second or thing. Or to existing uh, uh, narrative happening around. See, I don't mind. So say, for instance, Kashmir, there are so many narratives coming out. I'd like to uh, read all the narratives. From, so it has to be to honest, be, yes. not pandering to you know, certain uh, emotions or best-selling uh, charts and all of that. The second thing that I look for is good language. So I read in three languages. I read in English, Hindi, and Bangla. And uh, you know, whichever Great. language yeah. I'm reading in, it has to be in good, good language. Thank you. I have a point there with the gentleman. I'll come back to the panel after that. Yes. The basic prerequisite to read a book is it should be very captive and the perspective being detailed in the, in, in the book should be balanced, you know, it should, uh, it should show both sides of the coin. So that's most important. A balanced narrative, brilliant point over there. Uh, I'll bring it to uh, Raghav Ji to you. So when you were writing about caste, you've come back from a very privileged background of being a bureaucrat, been to the best positions in the country. How do you think you could become a voice of a Dalit who is not so privileged in life? So I've had uh, very close Dalit friends and uh, some of the things that I've, you know, briefly touched about broken relationships is something that I've seen happening in real life. Uh, of course, the genders change and uh, they get uh, switched in this, but I've seen uh, how uh, 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 a Dalit boy was very, very friendly in the academy with a Brahmin girl and suddenly one fine day they were going around and the relationship broke because uh, the somebody else's issue, the parents informed this uh, girl's uh, parents that you know you're going around with a Dalit boy and the relationship just crashed and she wouldn't even look at him because her parents had warned her and all this and this has happened in the IS and IFS if it can happen there I you know it can certainly happen I mean the gravity of the situation down below will be far far higher far, and far more difficult yes. and despite the fact that so many years have elapsed one has come across a tremendous diffidence in the Dalit attitudes towards us, the non-Dalits. I found uh, their hesitation in uh, expressing themselves fully, their uh, desire to speak in English, even when you address them in Hindi, sometimes they will uh, answer back in English because they feel that that is the right language to talk. Yes. So there are lots of such subtleties which I have tried to capture and had I not experienced mm -hmm. them, I perhaps might not have been able to do justice. That makes a lot of sense and we'll come back to that. Harshali, you've picked up a very bold topic for your second book. You've dealt with women's sexuality, her sexual choices and how the world r responds back to it. So, do you think it is time for us to talk about sex more openly, A, and B, more so does it have a gender divide where men can talk more freely but women can't? Actually, it's the other way around. Women, after a certain point of uh, time and age actually, are very, uh, very comfortable talking about their sexuality, expressing it, uh, you know, in the open. While I, I realize that men don't talk about it, and even if you ask them a pointed question, they will try to shy away or they will not want to talk about it, and especially not their own private lives. However, women are very open about uh, their sexuality and uh, what they like, what they dislike, what they, you know, so they are very, it's very cathartic to them. Uh, so, uh, so yes, the topic is bold, however, I feel that it's time we come out of this docile femininity, this beautiful, uh, you know, docile women, that, that, that concept that is in our societal mindset and actually understand that uh, women are now trying, trying and coming out in the open and talking about the choices that they have made. They want to talk about it, they want to write about it, they want to experience life on their own terms. So I think we are very much on our way to, uh, to, to this 
place and time where women will actually take over the reins. Okay, that's very interesting and it's heartening to know that uh, you know, the, the roles will reverse soon and that's uh, very exciting. Mr. Patil, over to you for a question here. That uh, uh, do you think, uh, you mentioned that you know, we should not take ourselves very seriously. But in the current uh, scenario in India where everybody is running after something in a hugely uber competitive environment, how does one take somebody not so seriously? You got to take things seriously, but not yourself seriously. You know, you take uh, you just uh, uh, don't think you are that important. You are not. You know, uh, but uh, serious matters require serious attention. Uh, this lady f here in front uh, look, is looking for honesty in, in books. I, my book is not for you. You know, it's not really honest. Right on the cover, I say it's unreliable memoir. If I wrote an honest book about myself, it would be deadly boring. You know. And I, so I, I, I wrote about myself, and I read fiction, masala into it, and it's selling rather well. And so it's, I kept it light, you know. I didn't. I worked at the United Nations for about 26 years. I was. I could have written a book on disarmament, on which I was an expert, or on nuclear weapons. I didn't even do that. It, you know, let other people do that. Those book, books end up in library as reference books. Mine is a readable book, light, and uh, sort of. Uh, I, I'm, a, I'm a jailer of. Kushwan Singh and Vinod Mehta, light, light. I, I don't say that my book writing is as good as this, but I, I really try to uh, look, 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 look at them as, as, as my inspiration. That's very interesting that you mentioned masala in the book. Raghav ji, what's the masala in your book and how did you take a special, you know, uh, attempt to add masala? What was that? Well, it came pretty naturally, I must say. And uh, I think it has got to do with uh, the kind of uh, life one leads and the hobbies one has. And okay, okay, hold on to that point. So he being a bureaucrat, he actually is accepting right now the life one leads and the hobbies one has as a bureaucrat is very rangin and masaladar. Yes, Am I to make had, that conclusion? One has had a very varied uh, sort of uh, diverse uh, experience and… Uh, Interesting. So, so a lot of that masala uh, has inadvertently come in in the conversations. And uh, that's for you to tell me which are the masaledar areas. Uh, but I do get calls from my nephews and nieces, and they say, you could have written that? And I said, yes, I've written Absolutely, that. you know, and you… They, they're shocked. They said, we never imagined that you could have written like that. I said, well, I mean, that's… It came naturally. I didn't contrive it. Interesting. You know, I want to share an anecdote over here. And I, I, uh, as a publisher, I published a book by another bureaucrat who comes from the railways. And he gave us a very interesting anecdote. So when they were, uh, they had just joined the service. So um, their mess food, wherever they were living, was very bad. Okay, so what they would do is that they hop on to the Rajdhani from Baroda, wherein the dinner would be served just after uh, the train left Baroda. Happily have dinner, get on to the next station, which is Ratlam, or rather it's the reverse, I don't remember now. And come take the next Rajdhani, which is coming back from Bombay to Delhi and come back and happily sleep over. So they do have very exciting lives. They have stories like this to tell. So I'm sure there's a lot more and I'm coming back to you for some secrets that you've not revealed as yet. Harshali to you. I don't need to talk about masala in your book already. It's there. It's, it, it, it's loud and clear. But the point that I wanted to ask about is that was it very difficult to put forward points that you did not go through on your own? Did you do interviews to find out more about them? Did you read articles? How did you go get to know about something as simple as, let's say, marital rape or something like uh, domestic violence or something like uh, maybe a threesome? Uh, a lot of research goes into each book, however serious or light, whatever you might write. I think um, uh, Mr. Patel said that he's written a very light book, but I'm very sure that it has a lot of depth in it. And I'm sure that he's being very very kind and <laughs> very, very sweet about it. However, uh, I think any book that you write uh, has to come from a place which you believe in completely. I, I will again say the lady who's sitting in front, she asked for honesty. I don't think as an author, any, anybody who's writing, uh, even an article, uh, when you read it yourself, if it does not sound authentic, you don't want it to go out into the public. You don't want anything which is superfluous or which is secondary, which will not hold to the test of time or to the reader's attention. I mean, if you are giving those 15 minutes to read that article or three hours, six hours to read my book, I want you to take away something from it. I don't want it to be uh, like a metro read or something that you would say, oh, I, you know, it's not such a big deal. So you're saying things that need to be written that should stay along with you. 
Yes. Right? I have a question back to the audience now again. There are a lot of different kind of books. Books that stay on with you, books that are good for one time read, books that you read for inter entertainment, read them, forget it, shut out, just gone dead. What would you invest your time in given the, uh, you know, you now have competition with your time. Every, every reader and audience has a limited amount of time. You have your TV, you have Netflix, Amazon Prime and you have books. And all that is competing against each other. So how do you find preferences for books and which kind of books do you now read? Do you read reads that, that are one time and forgettable, forgettable or reads that stay on with you? Again, we need the mic around. Yes, the mic over here, Vasudha. So I like to read, uh, I read a lot. So I now uh, for the last 10 years I found I've not been wowed by any book. Mm -hmm. So uh, now, so you have to change yourself as a reader also. And now I read books which teach me something. Maybe uh, the writer has handled the plot in a different way. Maybe the end is surprising. Maybe, uh, you know, the descriptions take me to some place else. So stories cannot be retold. That's the reason you read the book. But is there any particular category that you have been exploring which you think is much better than available on TV. The same narrative on TV, on Amazon Prime, on Netflix and in the book itself. Books are always better than TV. Books will never, That's very heartening never, to know. That's never very heartening take the to place know. of uh, TV or any other medium for me. <laughs> Great. Coming back to you all again. We have seen book rights being sold left, right and center. Okay. A lot of books are getting converted into next Netflix series, Amazon Prime and stuff. If you had to sell your rights for the TV, okay. Do you think the TV would do justice to your kind of a book? Again, same question to all three of you. Uh, I think my book, uh, the, the series is not uh, movie, I mean it's, it cannot be encapsulated it's not something in which three is hours. A it, ha it needs, format. yes, it needs a, a long, uh, an audience who will stay with it and you know, so watch the series. So this is more Game of Thrones. <laughs> okay, Raghavji? Yeah, uh, my uh, latest book is actually a collection of episodes and uh, anecdotes. So it runs into different chapters and I think it could lend itself to conversion of a cinematic kind into various episodes. Because you know, each one for instance, uh, in the academy that's the Lal Bahadur Shastri Academy of Administration where all civil servants have a collective 100 day foundation course. So there is one chapter on their village attachment and how the events un unfurl there, uh, where a Dalit is beaten up by a high caste, uh, uh, by high caste kids, how they are rescued. So, you know, all these could, each in, one of them be begins an episode. In, in fact, itself. I don't think a movie has ever been made on the Academy. Has it ever been made? I don't think any movie ever had the IS Academy uh, in any of his movies. So, this will actually make for a good first. Mr. Patel. Yeah, well, there's a writer in. America, who was offered uh, by a producer that he wanted to make a uh, movie out of the book. So he went to Ernest Hemingway and asked his advice. And Ernest Hemingway said, take the money and run. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, that, that's my philosophy. Anybody wants to make a uh, movie out of my book, please go and make it. Just pay me. You know. <laughs> I'm happy with my money. You do what you want with it. If you want to be involved, I'll do it my way. You do what you want. I don't give a damn as long as you pay me. You know, we don't make us money. And you know, if, if the movie made of my book, not likely, uh, I'm likely to sell more books anyway, you know. Uh, what I did once, I wrote a screenplay uh, and I tried to sell it. Nobody bought it. So I converted it into a novel and it became a bestseller novel. Yeah. And still nobody's interested, but that's what. <laughs> that's very interesting. Okay. In fact, I want to ask one more question to the audience. Have you all read Harry Potter and have you seen the movie? My God, yes. So what do you think is better? Is the movie Harry Potter better or is the book Harry Potter better? Okay, that young person saying books, I love that, absolutely love that. A young lady saying that she loves the book better than the movie. Anybody else? Anybody who says the movie is better? Oh, he says the movie is better. Absolutely right, great. Anybody else who says the movie is better? Well, why is the book better, lady? I don't think one can actually bring the entire series into a movie. Like, for example, my favorite book is the third book. And when I watched the movie, I was horrified. 
Third is Azkaban, right? Yes, the Azkaban one. I was horrified when I saw the movie. Like they just missed out all the main moments. The match against Ravenclaw, the Quidditch final. All our favorite moments were missing. Absolutely. And then just give that's the fire bolt at the end of the movie. You have to basically shorten, push everything back into two or three hours of it. That, that's difficult. Let's give her a big hand for being so articulate. Thank you so much. Thank you. Question back to you guys again here. Now uh, I'll start with you, Raghavji. Raghavji, a bureaucrat has a lot happening in life, right? I am sure a book will only capture some of it. Tell us some very interesting anecdotes that you had always wanted to bring out and tell people but could not, either because you did not have the audience or you thought it's too controversial. Well, there are lots of such uh, stories, and I. Uh, my next, One in particular, maybe. My next book will certainly sum up a lot of those things, like the Vyapam scam which occurred. Okay. This uh, honey trap thing that is ha that has happened. Okay. There are uh, stories about uh, wiretapping, you know, uh, unrecorded and unauthorized wiretapping that took place on officials, on ministers, and such like. Now, these are all very interesting stories that uh, one could piece together and write a thriller about, which the normal writer would only conjecture and imagine, but here one has actually seen... But and yet again, fiction, not non-fiction. See, fiction allows you more scope to, uh, you know, articulate yourself more freely, to allow a little spicy imagination to come in, okay. and to bring in the kind of masala which will make it readable to the uh, okay. audience. And it allows you also a certain kind of liberty to write the way you want to, because you don't want to be clobbered at some stage and told that you know, you've uh, written things which you shouldn't have been writing. The gag order, basically. So there is an official gag order on IS officers, is that true? When you're writing something like cars, Controversial. or about corruption, where you're bringing things like that into your stories, there, is, there are constraints, you know, and, and, and there's a training of 36 years which you can't get over overnight. Absolutely. But now that I'm liberated, well, <laughs> we get to see more from his pen coming out. Harshali, uh, your first book is also uh, sold as a guide for a man who wants to know how a woman thinks. How many of the men here actually claim that they know how a woman thinks? Or the most experienced man says so. <laughs> Nobody will ever know. So you attempted to put forward that element of how uh, a thought keeps on running in a woman's mind. So why did that come in? What was the whole idea of putting in the thought process of a woman in your book? Uh, primarily because uh, uh, there was a there is a cartoon. I don't know how many of you have seen it. It's very uh, famous that a woman has a thought bubble which has like a hundred thousand things happening, and out of her mouth there's a speech bubble with only two or three things. So there's so much going within going on within us. And uh, we sometimes don't articulate or don't say anything or we say less. Or uh, Imagine she's saying that she, women speak less. Yes. Yes. yes we women do. speak and less. I think all the women here would agree with me. All the husbands? <laughs> I want to know all the husbands. What are they saying? Yes, believe it or not. See? So, yes. So they, they agree with it too. That half the things we keep thinking and… They have uh, no option. Say, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes, please. Anyway, so uh, so yeah, so uh, the idea was to say that women uh, have a lot going on within them, and it is on the man uh, to be patient. I don't think it's gender specific. It was just that my uh, main protagonist was a woman, and it was the husband. But if we turn the tables, it can be same for any uh, partner. That if one person is uh, going through a, a time of struggle, it is the other partner who has to keep patience who has to show support and love and respect to uh, get the, pers the other person out of that strife. Okay, interesting. Uh, Raghavji, a uh, question to you, and I wanted to ask this to her as well, I'll ask you. It is usually said that a man writes a man character better than a woman character, and a woman writes a woman character better than a man's character. Your protagonist is a woman. So you've broken the rule. I don't think it's all that difficult to understand a woman's mind. But uh, he is a brave man who says so. Yes, and uh, you know, especially when you're, when you've had, uh, you know, you're surrounded by women, wife, <laughs> daughter, mother. So it's it's really not all that difficult. But uh, yes, uh, putting myself in the shoes of this protagonist was extremely difficult, 
and I, I think I've got through quite successfully. So I must say very that, well. That was, a, that was a very, very difficult thing. I don't think I can replicate that again. There are portions in the book where you've actually got into the mind of that Dalit lady and she's contemplating hard that how can I stand against or how can, how can I be so untruthful to this particular rebuttal when I have gone through the same thing. So those hard hitting portions, so it almost feels like you've actually sat down with somebody and have racked that person's brain to get what's there and then put that dilemma in the book. How did that happen? It just happened and uh, I think it was, as I mentioned, it was the job that I was doing which gave me that uh, kind of insight into, uh, and the people I was working with, a lot of them were Dalits. So I could kind of understand their uh, perceptions, their dilemmas, their experiences and capture them. And as I said, I could have only done it while I was there. Okay. Mr. Patel, coming to your book here, I'm sure you, it's very difficult to encapsulate somebody's life in one single book. You must be having many, many more parts that you've not put in this book. So A, do you plan to have a next book after this or did you have a selection process of I will put this and I'll not put this? No, no. I think I've said what I wanted to say in that book. Uh, my next book will be completely different. It's another screenplay I've written which nobody wants to buy, so I'm going to turn it into a novel. Yeah. It's, it's, you know, I, the idea, the plot is there, and it'll take me, but I'm a slow writer, I must say. Uh, it takes me about two years to finish a book. Uh, if, I, if I do 200 words a day, or 250, I think, uh, I'm happy, you know, 250 good words. You can get a book out in about a year or two or two years. And, uh, no, I, 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 you know, I've written on all sorts of things. I've written a novel, and that did very well, I must say, the novel. Uh, I've written a book on cocktails. I've written a book on lifestyle. Um, so I've written on different, different subjects. I like to explore new subjects. And by the way, uh, in my novel, the women play a very important role. They're, they're, they are strong characters in my, uh, in my novel. Uh, it's not difficult to write about women, you know. It's a, as, as long as it's fiction, I can't write about, say, yeah. say a, a person, uh, say, Indira Gandhi or something. Uh, I think a woman should do that. Uh, but a fiction, you can create a fiction, a woman, it's very easily done, you know. Great, thank you, Mr. Patel. I was just asking them, would they be interested in reading a few lines from their book? And I'll come to you as well. So, uh, Harshali, starting with you, why don't you read something for us? Uh, so, I'll read the, um, the book starts, uh, and just to give you a little bit of background, uh, the, the narrator in the book is the Haveli itself. Uh, the Haveli is like an old grandfather, um, colonial time, and he's uh, talking about or he's introducing the story. This reclusive twilight brings with it February winds that howl, choked full of untethered emotions. I bear them as best as I can, these wintry slate gray skies. This numbing cold makes me want to shield the ones I love the ones who huddle behind my lonely, fogged windows or sit next to a roaring fire warming their cold, aching bones. They think about the happy days gone by. More than anything else, this solitude makes me long for her sunny warmth that illuminates my heart. Some people have that effect. She is one of them. My bright star, my bumbling bee, my bhavya. That's the name of the protagonist. Nuri, who rests close by, celebrated in death as she never was in life, sings hauntingly sad guzzles these days. What ails her, I wonder. Every year, as the north winds make my foundations shiver, her melodious, heart-wrenching voice, full of grief, makes these months unbearable. I stand as I have stood for many decades, concrete and firm, one of the six daughters of the family that inhabit me now, calls me Anwar, fittingly, I suppose. The family that occupied my echoing interiors before the partition of this country had a child, my namesake. He played in my greens until the very end. Those were terrible times. Uh, I think I'll leave you to read the rest. Thank you so much. Interestingly, thank you so much. Interestingly, there is a real Haveli in Old Delhi which has got 100 doors. Today I met someone uh, just after my session before this and uh, uh, he said, uh, do you know I've been to that Haveli, I've visited it. 
so uh, that was something nice to look forward to i said we should go to that together now absolutely and that's the best part about authors and i will ask this from raghav ji as well that authors you have your own memory wherein you keep on putting and adding things which in future one day you will start using somewhere or the other as a as a character or part of the book she saw the haveli i think many many years ago yeah in college when i was in college we had gone to buy some stuff from chandni chowk for the 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 fest that, that happened in medical colleges and uh, i remember just walking into this haveli it was slightly dilapidated and i remember that the no light the sunlight was just coming in and there was the uh, you know the dust motes were there and that picture stayed in my mind all the arches and the, the you know the tall columns and and you you and actually that's true that you kind of save those pictures as if you you know so th- that became my nar- my narrator absolutely raghav ji what are you reading for us so this story kali's daughter begins in geneva in switzerland so it's dated 12th november 2016 and i am reading out from the prologue manthan the churning deepika thakur stares at her handwritten notes and curses her inability to enjoy the weekend and the weather outside merely for having to deny the undeniable there are four serious faces in the wood paneled room in the permanent mission of india to the united nations ambassador dr arjit singh tomar a seasoned diplomat with over three decades of experience the minister rohit mittal the counselor anurag sharma and she herself the junior most the only soothing feature is the aroma of hot darjeeling tea and i'm skipping portions huh the ambassador looks grim in a gray suit with a gray cashmere scarf blah 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 they haven't put on ties as they usually do each holds a copy of the unhrc report of the independent expert in their hands and has their eyes glued to some part of it the report highlights gross human rights violations in india emerging from the shadow of caste this is a setback for the image conscious government back home that brags of a giant leap in the human development indices Already incidents of atrocities against the weaker communities have begun to capture prime space in the media and will influence crucial state elections because caste is a key political issue the government stands to lose face both nationally and internationally naturally the hackles are raised and they want it neutralized summarily urgently as the second secretary of for unhrc matters she has indeed attempted a draft response she has struggled with it and has got stuck to her the observations of the report seem so factually true much as she had tried she can't see what there is to refute hasn't caste been the cause of exclusion and dehumanization of communities for centuries blah 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 left to herself she would just accept it she would be profusely apologetic and say they would do everything possible to correct things in the future when you've been slapping flies for centuries you have to admit that you're a fly swatter or fly catcher or beta simple as day it has to be done it is the honest thing to do but they want to refute things anyway deny blindly deny openly denial has become a way of life for governments clearly diplomacy and truth aren't easy companions perhaps diplomacy is war continued by other means and so on yeah okay. raghav ji before i for again move on to mr yeah. patel i have a question for you uh, mr patel just one question for him i'll and come to you give me a minute i had a question for you um, like she has brought in anwar or the haveli from her past is this something that you remember from your personal experiences non professional that you've woven inside the book yeah there are lots of uh, little little things that you know you experience but most of my experiences have uh, emerged and uh, come out of my professional uh, Uh, work you okay. know very few from my personal life but because one the professional has sort of overshadowed uh, the personal experience okay okay mr patel yeah i had selected a passage then i realized there are children here so i'm going to forego reading that uh, passage and i'll read something a little more acceptable uh, this is about the movie star rekha uh, perhaps this is as good a time as any to let you know that Rekha wanted to marry me. Yes, seriously. This was the time when she was going through a bad phase with a, with a, in her personal life, was a mess, with, with, with a, after an alleged affair with Amitabh Bachchan, ended her career, and, and, was, and her career was going nowhere. She heard that someone, 
that I that, that someone that that she heard from someone that I was living in Delhi alone and and had a had a cushy job with the UN. She flew to, into Delhi, and a meeting was arranged in Nidibar Niti, flat of of our mutual friend Bina Ramani. It did, not, it did not take her long to realize that marrying me was not a, such a good idea, and. Uh, I was not the, the one in the looks department. Besides, I was already, already married. A few days later, I met Mukesh Agrawal over drinks at the Orient Express uh, bar at the Taj Palace. He was a friend of mine, though not a good one, not a close one. A, 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 a fairly prosperous man, a businessman, making kitchen stoves and living with his parents in civil lines in Old Delhi. I told him about my encounter with Erika, and that was that she was uh, on the marriage market. Mika, M Mukesh rang Meena right away and pleaded with her to introduce him to Rekha. One thing led to another and they married soon after that and I thought it, it, was, it was a bit hasty and I was right. It took Rekha a week to realize that, that the two of them were very different people in every possible way. He was starstruck and she was down to earth. He, he, six months later, a reluctant Mukesh agreed to divorce, and within, within a month, he committed suicide. Rekha made no claims to his money or property, but knives were out for her in Bollywood. Shubhas Ghai told Stardust that she had put a blot on the face of the film industry, and Anupam Kher was quoted as, say, as calling her the national wimp in the, in the same magazine, though he later denied it. This was unfair. The Mukesh I knew was a decent man, but was very complicated. He was chronically depressed, with his, with, and with his bride behaved rather like a teenage fan. He, he had setbacks in his business and was eager to meet Rekha's rich friends who might be able to help him. The, the breakup of his marriage must have been a final humiliation and the loss of faith that led to his tragic end. Thank you so much. That's quite a revealing part of your book and may attract a lot of people to come and pick up the book. Before I come back to closing comments from the authors, do you have any questions for the panel? Uh, I want to share some information in Raghav Yes. Sir, I think we can do uh, we can do discuss this after the session here. Any other question, please? Any other question, please? Is there any other question that for the audience? Great. We'll back come back to the um, uh, uh, panelists again. I want to now know a little bit about your writing styles, Harshali, Raghavji, and Mr. Patel. A lot has been said about how novels are written. You know the language, and a lot of people said that the language is a very important factor in a book. So what kind of a, uh, you know, what importance do you give to the writing style and what are the important points that one should take care while writing a novel? So uh, I agree that language is very, very important. It should not be uh, a level where people do not understand it at all, wherein you need to open a dictionary. But th so this is a personal opinion. It can vary for everybody. But I like to read something that uh, that I can read easily, however, which has some amount of uh, uh, material or content which I want to go then go and find out more about, whether it is uh, vernacular used, whether it is uh, culture references, whether it is about a, a space or uh, where the book is based or a setting. So there is, uh, besides language, a lot, it has to interest me or hook me or want me to go and find out more about it. And that's what I try to do in my book. Great. Uh, Raghavji, what's your opinion on this? Yeah, so like when I finished my book uh, and the manuscript was 1,25,000 words. And my editor in Pan Macmillan uh, who had picked it up, uh, she said that, look, I mean, you can't possibly accept, uh, expect a reader, a modern reader to take in more than 90,000 words. So you've got to slash it down. And I began cutting it down, and it made the writing far more crisp and accurate. It, it was really uh, something which uh, hurt me initially, but at the end of it, I realized the uh, benefit of that. It came down to 99,000 words. I couldn't reduce it 
less than that, and she accepted it uh, willingly at 99. She didn't crib about that. But uh, one of the key features of uh, the book and about writing, if I may share my experiences, uh, my book is 90% dialogue, apart from a few opening, uh, you know, uh, paras which are uh, like uh, narrative. Most of it is dialogue, and that makes it easy to read and easy to understand. And the one advice I got from a literary critic was, keep it as simple as possible. Don't go in for words which you yourself are not comfortable with. Sometimes, you know, you're, you're attracted by certain words, and you fall in love with certain sentences, but that's not the correct thing. You can't afford to let your reader be uh, stupefied or confused about something which appeals to you, but may confuse That's you very good them. advice. Mr. Patel. Uh, I uh, try to keep it within 60,000, which is a minimum the, pub uh, the publisher needs, and 70, maybe, yeah, that's all. I, I don't think I've written a book that goes beyond 70,000. 70,000 takes me two years to write. I write, rewrite, rewrite, change things around, and uh, the publisher will want to make some changes also. Uh, that's fine. Uh, my, my, I like to keep it simple. Uh, short sentences, nothing pretentious, don't use long words. Keep it simple. Keep it readable. You, you, and uh, you know, I, I, you know, my book won't win any Nobel Prize, but it's a good read. That's what I aim for. So you know, uh, authors are not that serious people at all, and the writing process is definitely not serious. It's just that they're right, right now on stage and talking very serious things. But let me ask this, this erudite panel one last question. I'm sure in the period of your writing, you must have had some experiences which really made you laugh or open up. Harshalia, I know, and I can also say that for her. But uh, could you please tell us something which was more uh, as a memory, which was a lighter memory, something very interesting that you did? And yes, Harshali, you will say the same thing that we were thinking about. I think we, uh, yeah, we are on the same plane here. So I normally get my ideas when I'm either going off to sleep or Very important, to listen to this. <laughs> So I either get my ideas when I'm just about to sleep. So that's that period where you're half awake, half asleep in the morning and in the night. And I am a deep sleeper while my other half is a very light sleeper. And inevitably, the poor fellow is also a doctor, so is completely woken up again and again in the night. And so normally, I would just check him and say, OK, remember this idea, because I won't. So you are my hard drive. <laughs> and I used to put my ideas in his. Uh, head. It's said in a very nice way. It was I, I get up. I get a I get a pen and write it down because I won't remember in the morning. Yeah, same. So uh, I didn't need to do that. I had him right next to me. <laughs> so he she actually goes and threatens him that you better remember, otherwise it will be not good for your health. Raghavji, what about you? I go and play golf in the morning, so it's usually I get late for my game of golf because I've started scribbling something already, and thanks to the laptop. It's made life so much easier. I uh, have these little notes on the laptop, and I just scribble down whatever thought comes, and then come back and reflect on it. OK. Mr. Patel. Laptop, laptop is very useful for writing, I must say. You know, it's so easy to make changes. But previously, you to, when you were the typewriter, you had to retype the bloody thing and all that. Now you don't have to do that. You know? <laughs> and that's wonderful, I think. I probably am a better writer since uh, laptops came on the scene. That you could read it again and again and again? Yeah, yeah. Very easy to change things around. Uh, delete here, pr 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 paste there. The Copy kind of paste. So easily done, yeah. Interesting, yeah. One last advice that you would give for any aspiring authors who are there in the crowd for us. Or one advice to the reader. Just read a lot. Read and write and just take a, pick up a pen and start writing. Yeah, and then the rest will be the editor's job. You Their nightmare. You can't be a good writer unless you're a good reader, really. Yeah. Very well said. Yeah. Yeah, Read and write as much as you can and start making notes and uh, open a chapter and write it down, scribble whatever you can. You never know when 10 years later you might look back on it and there's a whole story that is uh, ready to be told. So don't lose that. Thank you so much Raghavji. On that note, it was a wonderful audience. Thank you for being with us. Their books.